Hey guys, welcome back. Make yourself at home, take off your shoes, grab yourself some coffee, and come watch me draw Poe's new design while I chat about the Life and Crimes episode. This is gonna be a pretty laid-back video. I'm a little embarrassed to say that I remembered to record this painting session but completely forgot to record the other fan art I drew of him and Magica, which was much better than this one, so here we are. I had pretty much given up on Poe appearing in DuckTales because the moment I heard the series was being cancelled, I knew it would be an enormous challenge to wrap up what's left of the plot threads and story in a coherent way, and some characters that were meant to appear and have a role in the narrative could end up being scrapped altogether. But we got Poe, and I'm glad we did. This is also his first appearance in his original duck form, before he was cursed into a raven. When I first saw the promo trailer, I kid you not, I literally cancelled everything planned for that Saturday and stayed home to draw this thing from 11am to almost 5pm. I don't even know why it took so long, it isn't a complex illustration or anything, it's not even cleaned up. But sometimes things take longer than planned. I'm trying to cut myself some slack by saying that it's my first time drawing him in the 2017 art style. <laughs> I know, excuses, excuses. First, a few quick notes on the art laps you're watching right now before I talk about the episode. I did the sketching and inking in my sketchbook, then scanned that into Photoshop and barely touched the line art and then decided on the color scheme and general lighting. At first I was gonna go with the series' typical flat colors, but then I decided I wanted to do a little more with the rendering to give it a little more atmosphere. I love creating fake screenshots and even though I didn't put any effort in the background whatsoever, I still wanted to give off a vague impression of an old backdrop, like an ancient European archway or the wall of a castle. Magica's backstory is my favorite part of this episode. Some other stuff could have been better and it's not just because of the pacing. But this video isn't a critique of the episode because I can't do that without discussing other issues in seasons 2 and 3. So rather, I just want to chat about the interesting parts, Magica's character development and Scrooge's. It's not surprising that Scrooge used to be quite self-centered in the past and not very empathetic. He's been by himself most of his life. Since he was a child, he had had to rely only on himself and only trust himself. He had seen the worst in people and almost died at the hands of some of them and had to learn the hard way to not give anyone any chances to screw him over. He had become aloof and closed off, not easy to manipulate or steer his sympathy. Practically speaking, this is what saved his life over and over again. It's a survival skill and it was only when he became involved with his family that his edges began to soften, and he then had something more important to him than himself and his wealth and accomplishments. Here's an interesting contrast with Magica in that regard, because even though she's obsessed with power and treasure as well, by the time she meets Scrooge, unlike him, she already has something that's more important to her than any of that, and that's her twin brother. Together, they're plundering and tormenting the hell out of a small village of people who can't defend themselves, and Magica's perfectly happy co-ruling with Poe rather than taking the glory all for herself, which is what you would expect in the beginning, and she's even perfectly content with sharing their power between them. It's when Scrooge is dragged into their palace by her and Poe's shadow army that he upsets the status quo. It's the first time Magica questions her true power when Scrooge manipulates her into feeling inadequate because she can't cast a complete spell on her own. It's ironic now, but sensible back then, that it's Scrooge McDuck of all people who tell her her family is holding her back from her true potential. Poe sees right through Scrooge's manipulation, but it's too late for him to intervene. She grabs Poe's amulet and begins firing curses at Scrooge in a rage, and because unlike the villagers, this man in front of them has the audacity to insult her and demean her to her face. Scrooge being a non-magic user has no respect for people who use magic to gain wealth and power. And when you look at the Dispel's tyranny with the villagers, it's a coerced and false respect. It's possible that magical people, including the Dispels in normal circumstances, are looked down upon and feared, and maybe even persecuted. By the looks of the village they rule, these events might have happened in a time and place where people had a lot of animosity and superstitious ideas about people who are capable of magic. 
Of course, the dispels didn't do themselves any favors trying to dispel these stereotypes. They only strengthened them with their oppression and use of dark magic, terrorizing people and turning them into animals and vegetables. So back to Magica and Scrooge's battle. She is trying to curse him into a raven and he deflects her spells and one of them almost hits her right back but Poe jumps in front of her to protect her and it hits him. The fact that Magica is willing to plead with her enemy and give up everything to save this one person is an emotion Scrooge would only truly understand later on in his own life. She took a risk against this joined enemy of theirs and it horribly backfired and she realized too late that her brother was right. It wasn't a battle worth fighting. Scrooge got away unharmed and made a lot of money from their encounter too while she abandoned everything and took off looking for her brother who had flown away. She never did find him and her tyranny only became more violent afterwards and without any real purpose as we see in her flashback about the Phantom Blot's village. Even though Magica was now definitely a more powerful sorceress, after she had fused her and Poe's amulets into a complete staff that allows her to cast complete spells, it has no taste and no amount of treasures the villagers of the town she terrorized gave her, no amount of fear she struck into their hearts gave her any satisfaction anymore. In fact, she doesn't even seem to care to keep the treasures she forced people to give her, she would get bored quickly and simply destroy the entire village and move on to the next. It became a vicious cycle and in our world's terms, Magica was engaging in highly addictive behavior, like when someone drowns themselves in alcohol to escape reality and then amps it up more and more and more until their body and mind gives out. This manic cycle of plundering villages then destroying them was Magica's way of coping with her grief trying to recreate the rush of having people bow to her and offer her treasure. But as we see in the flashback, it no longer meant anything. The rush was gone. The victory had lost its taste completely. She would grow angry and bored and destroy the village out of pettiness and move on to the next as if chasing a mirage. It didn't mean anything to her anymore because attaining power and wealth was literally a dream she shared with Poe. The true value to her was and had always been in the companionship through it all, the glory shared with someone she loved. I honestly don't think she ever loved anyone other than Poe. She had a chance with Lena, but even after all those years, she never got over the bitterness and loss. It blinded her and made her even more dangerous. And now there was no pragmatic mind to reel back her own impulsive one. In the last episode in the series, when Bradford threatens to kill Donald, Scrooge signs the binding contract without hesitation, imprisoning himself to a life without adventure. He wouldn't have done this in the past, but now with his experiences, we had seen firsthand that when it comes to family, some risks aren't worth taking. Because of all the enemies he had made along the way, it was that incident with Magica that he remembers with some guilt. And of all the people he stood to learn something from, he learned one of the most important lessons about family from the least likely source and from one of his most dangerous rivals. Given the circumstances of the series' end, a lot of fans wished events and characters could have been more fleshed out, but with a world as big as the Duckverse, there really isn't an end in sight. You can write for this world literally forever, so realistically, a finish line has to be set up somewhere. And that's the joy of it. The world is so large and colorful, you can always create amazing stories with these characters. Another interesting thing some people have been talking about is character interpretations and how someone can get the sense that a character acted differently or out of character across different episodes or different seasons. I see where these people are coming from, but things like that are inevitable when you're working with a large team of writers. I've never worked in a team of writers myself, so maybe I'm wrong, but it's inevitable that some inconsistencies will arise in story cohesiveness when many people are writing for it, and no matter what, there will be some conflict. Some ideas will stay, and some ideas will be shot down, and even if there are no problems and no resentment, writers' voices are different. 
you and I can write the same character with the same traits, the same backstory and motivations, and they can still come across to the reader or the viewer differently. Sometimes it's very subtle, other times it's extremely apparent. Sometimes it's so apparent a few minutes into an episode, you can immediately tell if this was written and storyboarded by so-and-so, while the previous episode was storyboarded by so-and-so. I admit, if I am hired to write for a show, I would prefer to be the only writer on the team with maybe an editor or two. And that's it. It's not a matter of ego, but it's because I would want to keep the voices of the characters and the overall product as consistent as possible. Like it's all coming out of the same source, all the water is coming out of the same well and you can tell because every sip tastes the same. Of course, it's inevitable to have many writers on a big TV series, but yeah, the smaller the number of writers on a show, the less the voice variation. Or what some viewers would describe as, in extreme cases, quote-unquote, out-of-character actions. Like I said, one of the reasons some people may feel that way is because they're experiencing how different writers write the same character from their different perspectives. This is, of course, extremely apparent in comic stories as well. Not just the doc comics, but comics in general. They're written by different people across a long period of time. They have different voices, even though you're reading about the same characters. This just comes with media that's episodic and goes on over long periods of time and can only be created with an army of people. Have you ever been in a situation where you and a friend witnessed a certain event and when you went to retell that event to another group of friends, your friend told the story in a way completely different to what you'd have said. It doesn't mean your friend is delusional or a liar, that is genuinely how they experience the same event, and it may be different from yours, and different writers will interpret the same character in different ways. That's why alternatively you don't have this issue with books and movies nearly as much. The narrative in these kinds of media are contained enough to have their vision and voice controlled by one person and maybe the aid of editors. Well, I guess I'll end the video here, guys. I hope I didn't go on too long and I hope you found this fun to listen to. I'd like to make videos like this again sometime, so let me know if you're interested and hit like on the video if you do. Thank you so, so much again for listening, guys, and stay safe.